Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, Doug Scott, you, you may have seen him perform here before, or speak here before. Um, today, he's talking about the hard road to Everest. This is the story of his how he got there. Um, from a scout, you know, a young lad climbing on the black rocks of Derbyshire, and the sort of incremental steps he took that developed his confidence and his ability um, through climbing, uh, you know, big walls and climbing all over the world and finally reaching the summit of Everest in 1975 with Dougal Haston. Please welcome Doug Scott. Uh, well, it goes back a long way for me. Uh, my father was um, a boxer. Uh, he became British European police champion and army champion and then British heavyweight champion, but um, amateur. He, he would make things in his spare time in the workshop and bring them home, toys made of wood. And one thing he brought was a sheet of plywood and on it, he um, wrote, for when the one great scorer comes to write a, against your name, he writes not what you won or lost, but how you played the game. So I wanted to keep as amateur as possible, as amateur as my father was. My father did this. He, and during the war, he was uh, got gardens going. This is my seventh garden.
This is the first time anyone's been above, uh, anyone's got a Camp 6 in and is operating above the rock band. So it's all looking a bit hopeful, except we didn't get here till 4, which is a bit late. Being 4 o'clock, we stopped there for an afternoon tea uh, here. Put, scooped a little hollow in the snow and uh, had a brew, melted, melted the snow with a, our little gas stove. Then carried on along this frontier ridge, which it is, between Nepal all in the light and significantly all in darkness, Tibet, where such horrible things have happened to the Tibetan people since the Chinese so-called liberated the country. Immediately caused the death of uh, 1.3 million, destroyed 6,000 monasteries, and the oppression continues. All kinds of horrible things happen all the time. And nobody's bothered that much because of the Chinese have got, become our main trading partner. Anyway, uh, here we are on the summit, finally, after three expeditions. Very happy to be there. I must say it was a, a unique moment in our lives and just feeling part of something much bigger than ourselves going off here. Him and me and great nature and nothing else. And when the sun finally went, we thought we'd better go and uh, headed off down, got down the Hillary Step in the dark, head torches failed, stumbled on a bit, wind had blown snow into the tracks. So in, in the end, we decided to sleep here where we had the brew on the way up. We dug into the snowbank and sat on our rucksacks then for the next uh, nine hours. Bitterly cold. A very significant thing, this, this bivouac for me, to survive it without a sleeping bag, without oxygen. My, my oxygen ran out on the summit, so I had uh, a good nine hours up here without oxygen. And uh, we emerged and got down without, as it happened, frostbite. So I certainly knew I would never need to bother with oxygen bottles again. Sartorial elegance. I think we proved on Everest in 1975. Um, finally, that you can climb a steep face like the southwest face of Everest uh, if you employ enough people, experienced people, you have a good leader as we had Chris Bonington, if you're well organised and uh, you're taking oxygen and you use fixed ropes, then you can more or less guarantee climbing anything. Well if this uncertainty as to the outcome is the key, what is the point of doing that again? Because you know you can do it. Obviously, for a real adventure, for a real kind of uh, memorable experience, and to do justice to the mountain, the only real way to climb is alpine style. 